to do. Are there those things that contribute to the drownings, though, that we're not really publicising properly? Um, I think I think it comes back to basics. It's like anything, you know. You know, you have to know how to survive in water, whether it's leaning straight onto your back and letting the current take you out and around and not drag you down. Yes, as you said before, being able to float properly. But these are basic things that we need to be taught. And as you will remember, Jim, in, in the early days, the teacher or Duncan Lang used to walk along the side of the pool and yep. belt you on the head with this bloody broom handle that he Damn. had. Um, but that was to your head down, to get you to t- uh, learn to breathe properly or to flick you around with a stick, to roll onto your back so you were able, when you got yourself into trouble, you knew to get onto your back. It was a reaction for you to do that. Now, we're not getting, and because swimming lessons, they are expensive these days as well, but we're not getting the fundamentals, like learning how to read and write. If we can't read and write, life becomes very difficult later in life. Um, The same as if we can't swim, life becomes very difficult if we get ourselves in trouble in the sea. Good to have your Mm. perspective, Philip Rush, and thank you for joining us today. So could could you do that? Could you actually, you reckon you could float well enough keep yourself if you know if you fall off a boat in the middle of the sea you'll be all right for a while no oh okay then (laughs) at least i have a life jacket (laughs) okay (laughs) we'll move quickly on uh i was going to have a rather longer discussion today about religious freedoms and freedom of speech but i can begin it let's talk about what's acceptable and what is not a controversial new game that depicts jesus buddha and other religious figures brawling is now available in new zealand fight of the gods and uh, sacred iconography, synonymous with Moses or Christ, is used as weaponry. And on players' forums, there are comments like extremely offensive, disrespectful. Your views, please, on this being played in this country. Should this be censored? What should happen? Um, I don't think it should be censored. I mean, I find it offensive. I, I find it particularly ironic that Jesus was a pacifist and yet he's belting people over the head, I think, with a crucifix in the game. Um Having said that, um, I don't think it will uh, get uptake. It looks like a, a cheap game to me. Um, kids aren't interested in um, religious figures, f- you know, fighting each other. They'll be more interested in the, you know, the games of war type programs that are a bit more realistic. Yeah, that's a good mm. comment. It's not rated highly as a game. I suppose that'll mean an end to it. What yeah. do you think when you see this? I mean, the bigger the big issue for me is 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 the broader one around around, around people who use religion um, as, a, as, 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 a, as a means to hurt other human beings. Um, whether this game um, has an impact on that thinking, yeah, I'm not too sure, but it's, it's, it'll be, it will depend on what, um, what the censor says. But as a practising Catholic, I mean, I am offended by it. Um, but when it comes to bigger issues where religion is involved, um, yeah, there's plenty of other... Big, big issues to tackle out there. Mm. You can vote to add a character, but there's probably no prize for guessing who the makers of this won't dare add. That's the other aspect, <laughs> isn't it? Uh, anyway, that's our last discussion for the day, all we've got time for. Victoria Stewart, have a lovely time in Dunedin at the reunion and the testing. Thank you, and thanks for having me, Jim. A pleasure to have you, and Peter Fata for you, always uh, a great pleasure to have you on as well. Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. Fata for time. Peter, bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Uh, Thanks, everybody. We're back tomorrow with the panel, as per usual, and Checkpoints with John Campbell, coming right up. Hello everyone. Tonight on Checkpoint, during last night's election debate, Bill English committed to a reduction of children living in poverty by 100,000 within the next three years. Welcome to our territory, said Labor. So how serious is child poverty in New Zealand? We visited New Zealand's largest primary school and spoke to its principal of four decades to find out. Also tonight, a pensioner declined surgery by Dunedin Hospital tells us he's in so much pain he's contemplated suicide. This on the day... The National Party announced an increase in elective surgeries if re-elected. Is that an $11.7 billion hole? We speak to, well, almost 11.7 billion economists, and then we get Stephen Joyce to respond, and victory for 16 uninsured Christchurch property owners. Stay with us. Checkpoint after the news.
RNZ News at five. Maloa Lele. Good afternoon, Katrina. I'm Katrina Batten. An Auckland family doctor says the month's outbreak there is having a massive impact on Pacific Island families. Public health authorities in the city say there have been 300 confirmed cases of mumps since July. They say that's more than the total number of mumps cases in the past 16 years. Health experts say those aged 10 to 29 are hardest hit. A GP who holds school clinics in South and East Auckland, Amalia Lavamai, says all the cases she's seen involve Pacific Island students. She says young people with mumps have to stay home for a period, as do those who haven't had the MMR vaccine and lack immunity. These students are needing to be excluded from school for a time to try and prevent spread as well. And their friends are getting worried about whether they're going to catch it from their friends. Their parents and their families obviously having to take time off of work to stay home and look after these kids. And again worrying about themselves or other siblings, cousins. Dr Amalia Lavamai. Economists from a libertarian think tank have come to Labour's defence after National launched an attack on Labour's alternative budget. National's campaign manager Stephen Joyce has accused Labour of having an $11.7 billion hole in its fiscal plan. But the New Zealand Initiative says Mr Joyce is wrong. Its research fellow Sam Warburton has taken a look at Labour's numbers. It's not my position to say that it's a good or bad budget, but they, they add up. They balance and in that sense they're sound. Sam Warburton wants an independent budgetary office set up to check parties' numbers to avoid such disputes in the future. Some of the smaller parties are dismissing child poverty reduction targets set by National and Labour as a cheap political stunt. Both major parties have committed to lifting 100,000 children out of poverty by 2020. Here's our political editor Jane Patterson. After his government refused for years to set a target, Nationals Bill English made the pledge during a TV debate last night and Labour's Jacinda Ardern followed suit this morning. The Greens say both have been late to the party and they've had that target since the last election. New Zealand First says it's a blatant political bribe that does not address the root cause of poverty, a lack of housing. The Māori Party says neither large party can be trusted to make progress on its own and it would introduce a universal living wage to lift all people out of poverty. This is Jane Patterson. Christchurch Rebuild Minister Nikki Wagner says a settlement for 16 uninsured homeowners could have wider implications. The group owned homes in the residential red zone but payments were confined to those with insurance. The Court of Appeal ruled this was illegal and today the government agreed to pay the litigants 80% of the pre-earthquake value of their homes. All of them had already been paid 100% of the value of their land. Nikki Wagner says the government may consider extending the payout to the roughly 100 uninsured homeowners who were not part of today's settlement, but this decision would be left until after the election. The Mayor of Buller District says the council is disappointed it hasn't received a response after it asked the government to halt the development of a new planned new health centre, a health care centre in Westport. The town's 35-bed hospital would be replaced with a 10-bed integrated family health centre. ACC would own the facility and lease it back to the West Coast District Health Board. The Mayor, Gary Howard, says it told the government a month ago that the health centre is not fit for purpose. It has been working with the uh, DHB and has been in correspondence with the Ministry of Health, but the current proposal is just not workable. It, we're looking for a 50-year solution, and this is just ridiculous what's being put forward. Buller District Mayor Gary Howard. The Ministry of Health said it planned to refine the design of the facility expected to open in 2019. The jurors deciding the case of a prisoner accused of raping three of his cellmates have retired for the night. William Kartipa has denied 14 charges, including sexual violation and threatening to kill, and is on trial at the High Court in Auckland. The jurors have been deliberating since midday. The rapes are said to have happened inside Katipa's cell, cell at Woody Prison during lockdown. The Crown says Katipa used violence and threats of violence to force his cellmates into having sex. Katipa's lawyers say the allegations have been made up and the complainants, one of whom is bringing a civil claim against the Department of Corrections, have the motivation to lie. It's five past five. 
to sport in the All Whites and the Solomon Islands have drawn their Football World Cup qualifier to all in Honiara this afternoon. Many New Zealand wins the Oceania qualifying tournament. New Zealand won the first leg of the tie 6-1 in Auckland last week and will now play the fifth place South American side in November for a spot at the World Cup in Russia next year. The All Blacks management has welcomed loose forward Jerome Kainal's return to the rugby field. Kainal left the All Black camp ahead of the Bledisloe Cup test in Sydney last month following the publication of a story in the Australian media. He was also absent for the test against the Wallabies in Dunedin following the following week but will play for Auckland against Taranaki this weekend. The All Blacks assistant coach Ian Foster won't say when he expects Kainal to return to the All Black squad. Look, it's step by step, and we just have we just wanted to give him time and space, and you know he's made a decision to come back and and play, and I think that's a positive thing, and then we'll just keep working on a week by week basis. Ian Foster, meanwhile, billionaire backer Andrew Forrest is vowing to continue the Western Forces fight with the Australian Rugby Union after losing an appeal to remain in the Super Rugby competition. The New South Wales Supreme Court has dismissed an appeal by Rugby Western Australia to remain in the competition, but Forrest has vowed to take the matter to the High Court of Australia. The New Zealand French Open doubles champion Michael Venus remains on course for a second Grand Slam tennis title this year. Venus and Taipei's Hao Ching Chan have enjoyed a come-from-behind quarter-final win in the mixed doubles at the US Open in New York. That's the news. A rocky relationship. Possibly a launch of an intercontinental ballistic missile capable of uh, reaching the U United States, you know, theoretically at least. A rocky road. All the side roads out here in metal anyway, so we, like, we're used to it, but townies aren't, you know. Vicky and Richard see them coming to the pub here and they go, you know, like, they're a nervous wreck, are they? They're, what a terrible road. And lollies in the jar. It's the slush fund. It's the thing that you just want to keep to one side. It's the cookie jar, it's the yeah. chocolate jar, it's the lolly jar. Sweetness and light. Guy and Aspiner and Susie Ferguson, morning report. Reports weekdays from 6. Then on 9 to noon, the wheeler dealings of Washington lobbyists and their New Zealand connection. And after 10, using the courts to defend the planet, we meet James Thornton, who founded the environmental law group Client Earth. Join me, Catherine Ryan, on 9 to noon after morning report on RNZ National. Met service weather through to midnight tomorrow. Northland, Auckland, Waikato, Coromandel Peninsula and Bay of Plenty. Mainly fine. Periods of rain tomorrow, possibly heavy. Thunderstorms also possible tomorrow in Waikato and Bay of Plenty. Waitomo to Wellington and Wairarapa, including Taumiranui, Taupo and Taihepe. Rain developing tonight, heavy and possibly thundery in places. Rain easing to isolated showers from Whanganui southwards by tomorrow afternoon. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, mainly fine, a few showers tomorrow. Marlborough and Nelson, occasional rain in Nelson, spreading to Marlborough tonight, then clearing Marlborough tomorrow morning. Buller Westland and Fiordland, periods of rain, some heavy and thundery with hail, especially from tonight. Canterbury, mainly fine with high cloud. However, periods of rain about the high country tomorrow. Otago and Southland, fine spells and a few showers, and the Chatham Islands, showers clearing today and a period of rain tomorrow. It's eight and half past five and you're listening to Checkpoint. Thank you very much indeed Katrina Batten. Coming up on the program tonight the 11.7 billion dollar hole. Was it? We canvass economists who are unanimous and Stephen Joyce responds live. Child poverty and whether it's getting better or worse. We asked someone who's conducted a daily study with over a thousand children for very many years. Our political editor Jane Patterson on last night's debate and what's happened since. And Christchurch quake outcasts, uninsured in the red zone and losing almost everything they are to receive a government payout. It's a big old checkpoint. Thank you for being with us. We begin tonight where the politics of health and health funding have become very real. A Dunedin man declined a specialist appointment by the city's hospital, says he's in so much pain he's contemplated suicide. Ted McKinnon, who takes a cocktail of drugs to manage his bone-on-bone -bone hip pain, was sent home from his last GP visit via the hospital in an ambulance. And an another Dunedin man, David Lang, says he's been waiting for a knee operation, also with bone-on-bone -bone pain, since his orthopaedic surgeon recommended it almost two years ago. This is National Today pledged to increase elective surgeries by 20,000 to 200,000 over the next four years if they're re-elected to government. Bridget Burke's story begins with Ted McKinnon reading his latest rejection letter dated August 30. Dear Mr McKinnon, 
the orthopaedics department is presently receiving more referrals that can be seen within current resources and capacity. You will appreciate that public hospitals have a set amount of funding for assessing and treating patients and as a matter of fairness, we are obliged to endeavour to see these people with the greatest need first. The information contained in the referral letter from your general practitioner has been carefully assessed. I am sorry to advise you that at this time, your allocated priority is such that we are unable to offer you an appointment for an assessment by a specialist. 66-year-old Dunedin pensioner Ted McKinnon reading a letter from Dunedin Hospital telling him that despite needing a hip replacement, he won't be getting an appointment with a specialist. Your referral has been returned to your general practitioner who will continue to provide care slash treatment for you. 71-year-old Dave Lang, who also lives in Dunedin, has been desperately hoping for a knee replacement since an orthopaedic surgeon recommended it in 2015. You've apparently got two cartilages and both have disappeared or gone or worn out, bone on bone. And I had an appointment with an orth orthopaedic surgeon who said that I need a left knee replacement. And that was fine. However, after filling out the national prioritisation form, I obtained a score of 64, which is below the threshold for surgery. I've been rejected for surgery three times. Today, at the Bob Scott Retirement Home in Petoni, the national leader, Bill English, and his health minister, Jonathan Coleman, pledged more than 20,000 more elective surgeries a year if re-elected. Mr Coleman said as New Zealanders lived longer, their access to elective surgery became more important. Well, the thing is with elective surgery, no government has provided every New Zealander with every operation they would like to have. So it is a commitment to a continual ongoing increase which is going to help meet the demand for elective surgery and make a huge difference in terms of quality of life. Ted McKinnon's GP Jan Cottle says his hip pain is now bone on bone. She says his quality of life is so bad he exists rather than living. In fact he was in so much agony the last time he visited her she had to call an ambulance. Got to the hospital um, and I laid on the Guernsey there amongst some other people, and there must have been about three or four other people lying and waiting to see the emergency department, and um, I just closed my eyes, but nobody came to see me the whole time I was there, and I, I must have been lying on the Guernsey for about nine odd hours, and um, then they wheeled me back out into the hallway again, and I just laid there, and then the doctor the come and got me again and went into this emergency department room, and the doctor pulled the curtains around and he came over, and and he asked me the questions and so forth, and um, and uh, I said I was um, I was uh, you know thinking of um, euthanizing, getting some you know euthanasia done to me, and um, and then he said, well, look, as long as I can do that, you know, I said, no, I won't. Mr. Coleman told Rest Home residents today, 87% of current GP referrals end up with a hospital appointment. There's only 5% actually that don't get an appointment, and the gap in between is inappropriate referrals. Labor's health spokesman David Clark disagrees. Well, that is absolute nonsense and misleading. 60,000 people a year do not get the specialist assessment that their GP recommends, and we know that that number is artificially low because GPs have given up referring. The president of the Medical Association has stated that on record, and I've spoken personally to GPs who tell me they've stopped referring because they know it's so hard to get the care their patients need now. Dave Lang, who thought he could look forward to fishing and playing golf in his retirement, now walks with a stick. After three surgical referrals and rejections, he wonders why he doesn't meet the threshold for surgery. My message to the Minister is stop and listen to what people are saying rather than telling us that they've done 50,000 more operations in, um, in the last nine years. That doesn't interest me. What interests me is being able to have my left knee fixed so I can do what I want to do.
Ted McKinnon, who also suffers from type 2 diabetes, says he's been in agony for at least three years, but his bone-on-bone -bone joint pain still isn't enough to even get him a specialist appointment. He survives on a cocktail of morphine, codeine and paracetamol. And I'm just wondering, is it easier for the department to have to take my leg right off at the hip so I don't have to bear with this pain all the time, or would it, you know, is it easier for them just to wait for me to, to get a position so I can go in and, and get my hip done? David Clark says the criteria and threshold for surgery at some DHBs is so high, GPs are finding referrals for surgery fruitless. Look, I despair at what's going on in the health system, and you do begin to wonder just how bad you have to be to get the health care that you need in New Zealand. For Checkpoint, Bridget Burke. Coming up on Checkpoint, Jane Patterson on the leaders' debate and the response to it. But arguably, arguably the most striking moment in last night's debate was Bill English committing to a reduction of children living in poverty by 100,000 within the next three years. Labor, who've put reducing child poverty at the very centre of their campaign, committed to matching that target. As recently as October of last year, John Key was rejecting such a child poverty reduction target because there wasn't a single agreed measure of what the extent of child poverty actually is. As Fairfax reported today, there are different measures. UNICEF puts the number as high as just under 300,000. Child poverty monitor about half that. And at the coalface, or chalk face, what are they seeing? In order for the answer to be meaningful, it has to come from someone with access to a large sample size of children who sees them regularly and has watched them for many years at close range. And I knew exactly the person to visit for that. I'm heading out to Finlayson Park Primary School in Manurewa, South Auckland. The last time I visited was in September 2015, exactly two years ago, almost to the day. I was working then on a podcast called Payday is Broke Day, and I went to meet the school's principal. It's a big job, this one, isn't it? Shirley Maihi. Ah. Uh, principal. Yes. Finlayson Park School. But it's a fabulous job. <laughs> Manurewa. Absolutely fabulous, and uh, when, um, you know, I've been teaching a long time. How long? 46 years. 46 years. Two years on, it's 48 years now. A role of over a 1,000. It's New Zealand's biggest primary school and one of New Zealand's poorest communities. So Shirley Mahi has seen child poverty at close range and in meaningful numbers. Two years ago, I asked her about her families. She said accommodation was their biggest cost and it was crippling for many of them. Two families in a house, another family living in a garage, caravans on the back of sections. This is the reality of how, they, how people are coping. September 2015. In September 2017, on the morning after a leaders' debate, saw the leaders of our two largest political parties almost falling over themselves to target child poverty. I've just arrived at Finlayson Park School, and I'm going back to talk to Shirley Mahi. Shirley, it's really nice to see you again. Thank you for having me. I was here two years ago. Have things got better or worse since then? Um, I think over that time we've seen quite a lot of increase in poverty and parents and families who are really struggling. Struggling with all sorts of things, um, job-wise, housing, health. Things seem to have gone downhill quite severely. I go outside, it's lunchtime, and the playground, as you can hear, is a buzz. Finlayson Park is a kids' can school, a Fonterra breakfast club school, plus daily milk for every child, and a fruit in schools recipient. The food and milk these children get at school takes pressure off homes where the bully in the household budget is still accommodation. I think our parents are still needing to work two or three jobs to make the housing rental payments. Or save on rent by crowding in together. And they do bring with them lots of issues that affect their learning. 
Shirley Mahi has seen it all. Multiple children sleeping in mouldy rooms, children sleeping in garages, in cars. But there's food at school and it's warm. I think in a lot of cases, the children see school as a kind of a haven. Did you see the leaders' debate on the telly last night? I must admit, no. Shirley was at a school meeting, but she heard targets were being set for reducing child poverty by both National and Labour. And she thinks how political leaders would learn more if they stopped at schools like Finlayson Park to look and listen and really notice. Have they been to the people who are working at the chalk face, as it were, to find out what the needs really are? What are they going to do about it? There's a lot of pie-in-the-sky kind of um, suggestions. But our, our parents need a house. They need food for their children. They need medical supplies. It's all very well to say free doctor's visits, but the medication that goes with it is, is sometimes unaffordable. The playground is noisy, tag is being played, balls are being bounced, there is sparkling chatter and healthy curiosity too. What is that? It's a microphone. Oh. You, you speak into it. Oh. <laughs> you can say hello into it. Hello. Hi. But it reminds me that when we do stories like this, we'll often hear from people who say, that's not real poverty, those children aren't really poor. Compare them with kids in Africa and parts of Asia. So I ask Shirley, what do you say to those people about what the children at the school are experiencing? What is poverty in New Zealand as you've seen it day after day? It's very evident. People don't need to be on the streets in millions to think that that's the only kind of poverty there is. Our children are coming uh, and showing evidence of no food, um, very little clothing, uh, certainly not winter clothing. Um, they are showing that um, in many cases, they are sleeping in cars and in, in areas that really are not conducive to human living. And for New Zealand to think there's no poverty, these are some of the things that we face every day. So, yes, we, we struggle with support for these kinds of families. And more and more, this is happening. Um, lots of families living in one house. Not good. Little food. Children without breakfast, without um, food at night, going home to a, maybe a cup of tea or hot water and bread, if they're lucky. Um, so they do need this. They do need support in a lot of ways and um, this shows poverty. Shirley Mahi, principal of Finlayson Park Primary School, New Zealand's largest primary school. Another of the topics that caught our attention in the last night's debate was when Bill English was put on the spot about the state of water quality with this question from Patrick Gower. What is your favourite childhood river and would you swim in it today, Bill English? <laughs> yes, the Areti River and I sw swam in it as a child and I'd swim in it now except that they've taken all the swimming holes away and pushed gravel into okay. it. The Oriti is one of the main rivers of Southland. It flows through the back of Lumsden, rises in the Southern Alps and flows south for 130 kilometres to enter the sea at Invercargill. So will Big Bill English really swim in it now if it weren't for the gravel? Our Otago Southland reporter Ian Telfer went to check it out. Bill English has really waded into this debate again by nominating the Oriti River as the one that he swam swim in when he was young. We've come actually to the Ariti River, standing in it now, just at where it meets Winton, uh, which is a town in central Southland, not very far from Dipton, where the Prime Minister grew up. Now, just over here to, near us is the Winton Bridge, where every year the Regional Council for Southland does a lot of sampling of the water. And what I can tell you about this river is it's rated as very poor in terms of water quality and swimmability. Today, it actually doesn't look that bad. There's a bit of slime on the stones, but the water itself is pretty clear. 
and uh, there's not a great deal of signs to tell you that this river is in trouble. But Fish and Game Southland, I talked to earlier today, and they tell me that this river gets worse and worse as it travels down from its headwaters up near Queenstown. And by the time it gets down to the estuary next to Invercargill, uh, it's thick with mud, so much so that famous cockle beds have been covered with slime. So this is a river that, although it doesn't look so bad today, uh, is not that healthy. And despite the Prime Minister's uh, uh, nostalgic remembrances, probably not such a good idea to swim in. Ian Telfer at the Oreti. 25 past five, a group of Christchurch red zone homeowners has won a six year battle with the government. The quake outcasts who were uninsured at the time of the quakes took their case to the Supreme Court to challenge the government's offer of 50% of their property's rateable value. They argued that clearing the red zone destroyed any value left in their homes and it was unfair for them not to be included in the red zone offer. Now the court ruled in their favour in 2015. And the government raised its offer to 100% but of the land value only, no improvements. The group led by Christchurch lawyer Grant Cameron continued to fight and today the Minister for Greater Christchurch Regeneration, Nikki Wagner, announced the outcasts would receive 80% of the pre-earthquake value of their homes, including improvements. This on top of a payment for the land they'd already received. Ian Gibson is one of the group of 16. His wife's aunt, Jean Burgess, had a house in Bexley that was damaged in the quakes, but she had dementia and had forgotten to renew her insurance. A relief, I think, is, is my biggest reaction. It's just nice for it to be over. It. Um, you know, it's uh, it's been six over six years now, and it's it's a relief to be able to go. Well, oh, that's over. It's finished. It's done. Over six years. Mm. And what's the sum of money we're talking about? Well, what they've what they've offered us is, is um, they've offered us eighty percent of the uh, valuation, the improved valuation for so for the house plus interest. Um, so we, we get what we ask for, but at the moment what we don't know is, is what all the legal costs are going to be. So we'll probably end up with something close to what we asked for. And this has dragged on and on uh, uh, through court case after court case, which in fact the Crown kept losing, right? That's correct, yes. So this is the fifth, fifth court case we've been through now. And did you feel at some stage that the defence was almost vexatious? Well, you certainly got that, that from, uh, from early on, that, that they were trying to drag this out and were trying to, to, to fob us off or hope we would go away. Um, and that certainly came through after the, you know, after the Supreme Court uh, ruling that they just seemed to want to let it uh, drag on and, and hope we would hope we would just give up. If I recall correctly, from the very first judgment, and 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 like all our listeners and like everyone involved, my brain is trying to grind back the best part of six years. But from the very beginning, the court was pretty unequivocal about Jean's right in these circumstances to have some kind of assistance protection from the government, right? That's correct. The, the first case, uh, the first court, first court case, uh, the High Court here in Christchurch ruled in favour um, that um, basically the, that it was not about insurance. Uh, it was about the government taking the land. This was, so this was the red zone land, right? That's correct. She was in the red zone and effectively we couldn't do anything with the property. We couldn't sell it. We couldn't repair it. We couldn't rent it. Uh, and, uh, you know, and when that, when they made the, the offer, which was for for pay for half of... Originally, the, the original offer was for half of the land only and nothing for uh, in, in, uh, the improvements on the, on the property. And that was when the action started, when they made their first offer because it was patently wrong. And that's, 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 that's where we started and that's where it's got to now. Uh, yeah. And so there is no precedent here unless there is another red zone situation. So if Jean had forgotten to insure a home and it had burnt down, there would be no claim against the Crown whatsoever. What makes this unique and why the claimants, the appellants, kept getting victory after victory in the court was that the Crown had determined that this land could not be used for any other purpose and that people had to leave it and they could not sell it. It was a red zone. That's correct. That's correct. So so we, we, we had... We had no choice. We didn't have. We don't really have. You know, there were no options for it. 
uh, we were basically stuck. For, forgive a question which I hope is not going to be upsetting. Is, is, is Jean had dementia? Is she still is she still with us? No, no. Jean Jean died uh, a couple of years ago now. Uh, fortunately for for her, she um, she was past understanding what was going on with her house, which she would have been really upset if she'd known what was happening to it. But no, she her dementia. Uh, she went downhill after the earthquake and and she died a couple of years ago now. Quake outcast Ian Gibson, Jane, not her real name, who couldn't afford insurance, says she suffered from depression over the past seven years, hoping, hoping this day would come. A lot better, a lot better. Um, no, just living in limbo for seven years has, has taken a lot of toll. And that, um, it's just, you know... We were frightened to spend a dollar because we did not know where we were going to be. Why didn't you have insurance when the earthquake hit? Um, because of the size of my house and the, um, the cost of the insurance for such a big home and my husband had left me. And so... Basically, forgive me for being really blunt about this, but you were elderly and poor and you couldn't afford... You just didn't have the cash to pay your insurer, right? No, no. no. And, no. When, and when the land was red zoned and you had to leave, not only had you lost your property, you'd lost anything you could have sold. You didn't even have the land value. You were getting nothing, right? N nothing. We were just... we. We were forced out on the street. Uh, it was just the way it was all handled. Um, uh, I mean, you know, it was just so hard to know which way to move. And that because with Jerry Brownlee um, saying that we had to get out because he red zoned us, uh, no, the house wasn't livable, but it was better than nothing. And where have you been living? Um, well, we scratched by, and it was only through the chat I met through the earthquake that we put together what we could put together, because um, you know how much um, rent was went up, at the time, we scratched enough to be able to um, put down for a, another home. And you kept winning in court, right? So every time, from that very first victory in the High Court, you must have thought, yes, this is going to be resolved. I'm going to get my settlement. I'm going to get my money. I'm going to be able to get on with my life. Uh, I, I, I could not deal with it. If it wasn't for the chat I had met, he has been my rock. I I didn't want to know nothing about it. I didn't want to handle it. If I if I hadn't have met him, there's no I would have just ended up in, in um place like Hill Morton. How did you find out that it had been settled? Who told you? Our lovely Lovely grud, great Cameron. What was your response when he told you? Oh, I just went yippee. Uh, you know, because every time we would hear after a court thing, we just thought, oh well, is this it? it what's you know, where are we now? But it just went on and on and on. And, I mean, it was just so hard to face each day. What are you going to do with the money, Jane? Oh, I don't know. I feel like I've won the lotto. Because um, we'll finish paying off our mortgage. 
Um, that'll be our first thing. And then I think we're entitled to a holiday. Where do you think you might go? Have you, have you thought about that? Somewhere nice and warm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you have a wonderful time there. Thank you very much, Mr Campbell. Coming up on Checkpoint, the woman who says she threw rat poison at National Minister Nick Smith. Mumps spread throughout Auckland. Big numbers of mumps. Stephen Joyce is going to join us later to respond to all the economists who can't find an $11.7 billion hole. We're going to hear from them too. That's after six. We'd love your feedback on hospital waiting lists and child poverty. Indeed, anything we're covering on Checkpoint, you can text us 2101. You can tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. We're on Facebook, of course, and our email address, as you know by now, is checkpoint at radionz.co.nz. 5.35, which means it's time, well, past time for the headlines. Katrina Batten. An Auckland family doctor says the mumps outbreak there is having a massive impact on Pacific Island families. Public health authorities in the city say there have been 300 confirmed cases of mumps since July and there's no sign of them abating. They say there's more than the total, that's more than the total number of mumps cases in the past 16 years. Those aged 10 to 29 are hardest hit. Nationals campaign manager Stephen Joyce is continuing his attack on Labour's alternative budget, insisting he's right and the economists are wrong. He yesterday accused Labour of having an $11.7 billion hole in its fiscal plan. But a series of economists, including from Bill and the New Zealand Initiative, say that's not true. Some of the smaller parties are dismissing child poverty reduction targets set by National and Labour as a cheap political stunt. Both major parties have committed to lifting 100,000 children out of poverty by 2020. The Christchurch Rebuild Minister Nikki Wagner says a settlement for 16 uninsured homeowners could have wider implications. Since the government agreed to pay the litigants 80% of the pre-earthquake value of their homes, after a court of appeal ruling. Ms Wagner says the government may consider extending the payout to the roughly 100 uninsured homeowners who are not part of the settlement. The Nelson woman who fought for change to rules around the use of medicinal cannabis since the death of her son Alex in 2015 has confirmed she wiped rat poison on the Nelson MP Nick Smith on Saturday. Rose Renton says she did it to send a message about the lack of respect for democracy. She says there was no threat to anyone's safety. And to sport, the All Whites and the Solomon Islands have drawn their Football World Cup qualifier to all in Honiada this afternoon, meaning New Zealand wins the Oceania qualifying tournament. That is the headlines. Which means that New Zealand plays the fifth-ranked team in South America, right? Yep. Currently right. Argentina, I think. Mm. Ooh, let's turn to business news now with Jonathan Mitchell. Hi, Jono. We've got another soft reading for building activity. Is that right? That's right. This is the volume of building work put in place in the June quarter. John, uh, really down in that quarter. A soft picture. This is against this political backdrop calling for more houses to be built, uh, given record immigration. So a second soft quarter in a row. Not a good sign. Uh, the volumes were were down primarily because of the winding down of uh, the Canterbury rebuild. But beyond that, there's capacity pressures, a lack of skilled staff. Uh, one commentator pointed out that there just aren't enough hours in the day to do the work that's required, as well as availability of credit banks being a bit more picky where they put their money. So the building sector appears to be at capacity, nearing capacity. Uh, this may not be a good sign for the quarterly economic growth number expected to be around 1%, so just watch that one. OK, what does today's measure on commodity prices show? A bit of a mixed bag, depending where you look. Overall, it's an ANZ survey for the month of August. It was down 0.8%. Uh, similar result in July. Um, dairy prices were slightly low. That was really driven by a fall in skim milk powder. That fell uh, more than 5% last month. But elsewhere, meat prices were down around 3% led by beef. Uh, in terms of wool prices, though, that's been a bit of a soft spot recently. Uh, that picked up off its lows. Horticulture prices fell, but it was a strong reading for aluminium. Uh, 
in terms of dairy, uh, the outlook is really flatlining. We've got another dairy auction overnight tonight, so Giles and Alexa will bring you full details uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, Fonterra has set an improving forecast payout in recent weeks, and the new season is really set to ramp up, but really whole milk powder, that key commodity, likely to stay around that 3,000 level, which is good news for farmers. That's their break-even range. Thanks, John. What happened on the markets today? Uh, just before I get to locally, um, Australia, they've kept their uh, cash rate on hold at 1.5%. That was widely expected. They do have an upbeat picture about the global ec economy, but they are just wary about the strength of the Australian dollar. But back here, the top 50 index fell 31 points. A bit of a seven theme going on tonight, 7,777. And the dollar, 71.7 US cents and 90 Australian. John. Thanks, Jonathan Mitchell. With all the sevens joining us from our Wellington newsroom, mumps is spreading throughout the Auckland region with 300 confirmed cases so far this year. Public health authorities say that's more than the total number over the previous 16 years. They're pleading with young people who've not been immunised to get a free jab fast. Our health correspondent, Karen Brown, has more. Health authorities say there is no sign of the mumps outbreak abating and those most at risk are aged 10 to 29. They are part of a so-called lost generation who missed out on the MMR vaccine during a controversy that wrongly linked it to autism. A change in the timing of the second dose of the vaccine in 2001 also confused many, lessening overall immunity. A medical officer of health, Josephine Herman, says there are major gaps in immunisation and it's a huge problem. We shouldn't be seeing um, measles, rubella and mumps in this day and age with the technology that we have and the advances we've made um, in health services delivery and we know that vaccination works. Dr Herman says 60% of all cases so far this year affect young Pacific adolescents. That's backed by an Auckland GP, Malia Lavamai, who runs school-based clinics in South and Eastern Auckland. She says all of the cases of mumps she's seen this year involve Pacific Island students and the effects on them are massive. These students are needing to be excluded from school for a time to try and prevent spread as well. And their friends are getting worried about whether they're going to catch it from their friends. Their parents and their families obviously having to take time off of work to stay home and look after these kids. And again worrying about themselves or other siblings, cousins. Dr Lovermai says the first dose of the vaccine has always been given at 15 months, but the second dose moved in 2001 from age 11 to age 4. If kids were aged 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, they might have missed that second dose because they thought they were waiting till they were 11, but actually they needed to now have a catch-up because they were past four years of age. She says not being fully immunised can pose very serious risks for young men and women from measles, mumps and rubella. She says sterility is a rare complication of mumps for men and there are other potential problems for pregnant women. If they're not fully immunised and do contract mumps or rubella or measles, then there are an increase in miscarriage rates and other birth defects as well if they contract the measles or mumps or rubella during their pregnancy. 80% of children up to 12 have had the MMR vaccine, but only 60% of Pākehā children were covered in 1991, with rates for Māori and Pacific children lower at 42 and 45% respectively. An Auckland University vaccine expert, Helen Patusas harris says such low coverage means the outbreak should have been expected, adding it's not known how many of those aged 10 to 29 are immunised. And we can't track in these age groups uh, who's been vaccinated and who hasn't because these guys were born before we implemented our national register where we can track people so we can track the younger ones but we can't kind of track the older ones down so easily. Doctors are urging anyone who missed the free vaccine or can't remember whether they got two doses to check with their GP and get it now if needed. Those who got vaccinated in the Pacific and may not have had the mumps component should also check. Meanwhile, 14 people have got the disease in Dunedin since an outbreak began there last month. Mo te hotaka o te ahiahi, ko Karen Brownahoe.
An Auckland detective has told a coroner's inquest he believes a 64-year-old woman was injected with insulin leading to her death but said he didn't have enough proof to make a criminal case. Heather Ann Bills died at Middlemore Hospital in 2013, six weeks after she was badly burned in an explosive fire at her Oraki home. Our reporter Tom Furley has been at the Auckland District Court where the coroner's inquest into her mysterious death is being held. Heather Ann Bills loved fashion, design and Cliff Richard. Her daughter, Michelle Ma, told the court she had suffered from a long and difficult mental illness. Highly functioning and successful on the outside, yet unable to enjoy the simple pleasures of life that many of us take for granted. I ask of everyone present here today that when considering the events and evidence presented that you picture my mum, the teacher, tutor, small business owner, mum, nana and great cook. On Thursday the 22nd of November 2012, she rang her son, upset as she tried to find money to buy her former husband's half of the house after their divorce four years earlier. Detective Senior Sergeant Ross Elwood says Heather Bills then went out to buy two petrol cans and filled them, and that night was pulled by her neighbours from her burning Oraki home. Her handbag contained approximately $5,000 and a handwritten note which stated $5,000 to pay for cremation. Within 24 hours, I do not want to be embalmed, cheapest plain box, clothes I am wearing, no funeral, no notice in paper, put ashes in the bin. I gave the dog sleeping pills before I gassed him. Ms Bills was taken to hospital with serious burns and started to improve, although she expressed suicidal thoughts. Late on the 26th of December, her condition deteriorated quickly and unexpectedly. The police say medical staff missed that she was going through a hypoglycemic event for several hours and by the time it was discovered and treated she suffered an irreversible brain injury. She died a week later on January the 2nd 2013. At this time there was unanimous consensus that my mother had been administered insulin. What was not known was how it was administered and three potential ways were identified being by herself, deliberately by others or accidentally. Ms Ma told the court one doctor said her mother had to be injected with a shipload of insulin to record such low blood sugar levels. The police were called in four days after Heather Bill's suspicious deterioration. Ross Elwood told Michelle Ma that while he personally believes someone injected Ms Bills with insulin, expert disagreements and complications meant he didn't have a case. I have my own view on whether your mum was injected or not, but it's, my, my view is not important, it's what I can prove in court. Um, and I still think that, that just based on that one element alone, we've got some issues if it were to come to criminal charges, let alone actually identifying someone who may have either accidentally injected your mum or provided your mum with the insulin to inject herself or deliberately injected her with the insulin. Ross Elwood said it was understood Ms Bills was bedbound and too weak to have taken insulin herself. He said all medical staff were interviewed afterwards and the police had three suspects, however none admitted to giving Miss Bills insulin on purpose or by accident. Miss Ma says her family wants answers and for any deliberate, careless or unprofessional conduct to be held to account. It is often said that a true test of a community is how it looks after its most vulnerable. My mum did not deserve to die in hospital like that and my family deserved the right to know the cause and circumstances surrounding her death. Chief Coroner Judge Marshall said it is her role to determine the cause of Heather Bill's sudden deterioration and if insulin was the source, where did it come from and who administered it. 31 people, including medical staff who tended Miss Bills, are to give evidence with the case set down for two weeks. At the Auckland District Court, for Checkpoint, Tom Furley. The woman filmed throwing rat poison at Nelson MP Nick Smith has been identified as Rose Renton, the woman who fought for changes to medicinal cannabis rules after the death of her son Alex. Dr Smith has complained to the police after he had what he says was rat poison rubbed into his clothes and face and threats were made against his family during his regular public meetings next to the Nelson market. The incident on Saturday coincided with the start of an aerial drop in the Nelson Wildlife Sanctuary of poison after the Brook Valley, Valley Community Group lost several legal bids to stop it. Ms Renton explained to our Nelson reporter Tracy Neal why she threw the rat poison. Um, it was a symbolic gesture to show Nick Smith exactly how it felt for the Brook Valley residents to have 26 and a half tonne of brodificone dropped 
without safety measures on the loading site, without 48 hours required notice to the surrounding community and without signs until I think the third load went up. So they felt violated. Uh, So the best message for me to convey was exactly how that felt for them. And that was why I did what I did with my husband, Guy. We didn't go near his caravan. I didn't go in it. I rubbed the poison on the front step of the caravan and I rubbed it on the table and we wiped his lapels on his jacket. And there's no democracy in this country anymore. So unless you do something reckless, as the media will no doubt convey me as, um, you just don't get heard. And people are sick of being ignored. Rose, do you think it's more to do with the fact that people feel disempowered by the change in the law that created the pathway for this drop. Do you think it's more to do with that or is it really linked to the to the substance that's been dropped? I don't think poison is ever an option and it's too late now because it's been dropped. The people weren't respected or listened to and my gesture gave an example of how those people felt. Have the police spoken to you? No. Do you expect they will? I'm sure they'll look at the video. Does it concern you that you could be charged? Not in any way, because I mean what I did. I don't regret what I did. Rose Renton says it was a direct message of passion and anger and there was no threat to anyone's safety. Dr Smith and the volunteers helping him on Saturday said it was an upsetting incident. The US says North Korea's leader is begging for war amid reports Pyongyang is planning to test a long-range missile just days after detonating a nuclear bomb, attracting widespread international condemnation, including crucially from China. The UN Security Council will consider new sanctions against the regime, but North Korea's allies, China and Russia, continue to push for a different approach. The ABC's Stephanie March reports from Washington. At an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council today, US Ambassador Nikki Haley had a stern message for North Korea's leader. Nuclear powers understand their responsibilities. Kim Jong-un shows no such understanding. His abusive use of missiles and his nuclear threats show that he is begging for war. War is never something the United States wants. We don't want it now. But our country's patience is not unlimited. There was universal condemnation among the 15-member body over North Korea's latest nuclear test, including from Russia and China. But the council remains divided on how to move forward. Despite the tough talk from Donald Trump to unleash fire and fury on North Korea if it continues its provocations, the immediate focus of the US and its allies is a diplomatic response. Nikki Haley again. The time has come to exhaust all diplomatic means to end this crisis. And that means quickly enacting the strongest possible measures here in the UN Security Council. Only the strongest sanctions will enable us to resolve this problem through diplomacy. We have kicked the can down the road long enough. There is no more road left. Russia and China are pushing for a so-called freeze for freeze. North Korea would halt its nuclear program in exchange for the US and South Korea stopping military exercises. China's ambassador to the UN, Liu Jiayi, told the meeting the idea is practical and would ease tension quickly. We hope that the parties concerned will seriously consider this and actively respond to it, he said. Nikki Haley hit back. The idea that some have suggested a so-called freeze for freeze is insulting. When a rogue regime has a nuclear weapon and an ICBM pointed at you, you do not take steps to lower your guard. No one would do that. We certainly won't. The U.S. will release a new resolution against North Korea for the Security Council to consider this week. Possible options include banning North Korean textile exports and its national airline, stopping supplies of oil to the government and military, preventing North Koreans from working abroad and putting an asset freeze and travel ban on more top officials. Russia, which holds veto power at the UN, has hinted it won't approve any resolution that focuses solely on sanctions, saying they haven't worked in the past. The US wants a vote on the proposal next week. That's the ABC, Stephanie March. Principals have rubbish National Party claims that school property is in the best shape it's ever been and that nearly 4,000 prefabricated rooms are state-of-the-art classrooms. 
In last night's leaders' debate, National Leader Bill English described 3,700 prefab classrooms as, quote, modern learning environments, a new style of open plan classroom. Our education correspondent John Gerritsen filed this report. Bill English says the government has spent $5 billion bringing schools up to scratch and the 3,700 prefabs in schools are modern learning environments. The classrooms you're talking about are actually called modern learning environments. We are, well they are, they are, they are. It's a jazzy name for a prefab. Our schools, our schools, our schools are in better physical shape than they have ever been right now and we're not finished yet. Deirdre Alderson is the principal of Auckland's Willowbank School, where about half the classrooms are relocatable buildings. She says Mr English's claims provoked an instant reaction from her colleagues. My phone was going red hot from not only uh, capital principals but a lot of staff, a lot of teachers around that I know who were saying, hang on a minute, we've got lots of relocatables and they are definitely not modern learning environments. Out of many of the things in the debate, that really did stand out because, you know, it's not true. Deirdre Alderson says her relocatable rooms are only 10 to 17 years old, but they are not modern learning environments. And she doesn't agree with Mr English's claim that schools are in the best shape ever. There's many schools around that are in dire need of modernisation and that costs a lot more than what can go into your property grant. And then there's schools like mine that are 21st century schools that unfortunately have got you know, leaky building syndrome, etc, etc. So if you were looking around, there'd be some discrepancies. The president of the Principals' Federation, Fetu Cormac, says despite the government spending on property, a lot of schools are not in great condition. We've got schools that are struggling where they are overcrowded and we hear of schools having to use staff rooms, libraries, old dental clinics for young people and in some cases prefabs are being delivered to schools. These are not modern learning environments, they are merely spaces to fill the gap for the young people where the school is overcrowded. Mike Williams from the Secondary Principals Association says the national-led government has spent a lot of money on school property, especially in Christchurch but he says there are still a lot of problems to fix. An awful lot of our infrastructure dates back to the 50s and there's no sight of that being replaced in the near future. A um, huge amount of prefab classrooms around schools, a very small percentage of that are quite new and quite good. A large percentage are 20, 30 years old and they are prefabs from what everyone remembers when they were at school. Probably the same ones. Mike Williams says schools' ageing infrastructure poses a big challenge for the next government, whoever it might be. A National Party spokesperson says many of the 3,700 prefabricated or relocatable classrooms have been modified to incorporate features of modern learning environments. For Checkpoint, John Gerritsen. Coming up to the news at six, but before then, the bookies are already taking bets on names. The tabloids have cleared their front pages. It does seem a tad premature. Prince William and Princess Kate are expecting their third child. News that was revealed after the Duchess of Cambridge was forced to cancel an engagement due to awful morning sickness. The new prince or princess will be the fifth in line to the throne, pushing Prince Harry further down the royal pecking order. I suspect he won't be disappointed about that. The ABC's Nick Dole reports. The news had only just broken when the Queen appeared in Scotland. She came to Queen's Ferry to open a new bridge. And when she emerged from her car, she was beaming. In London, the announcement came perhaps earlier than initially planned. Kensington Palace announced the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge are expecting their third child. The, the Duchess was due to visit a children's centre, but she's suffering hyperemesis gravidarum, an acute type of morning sickness that requires medical care. She experienced it during her previous pregnancies as well. Prince Harry was the first royal to publicly respond to the news during a visit to Manchester. Fantastic. Great. Very, very happy for them. And how's your sister-in-law doing? Uh, I haven't seen her for a while, but I think she's OK. Already, speculation's begun about what the baby's name will be. But royal historian Hugo Vickers says due to recent changes to succession laws, the baby's sex is a moot point. Whatever sex the baby is, um, it will not push Princess Charlotte out of the line of succession uh, down a point, so, because it's all been changed. So you will have, first of all, Prince Charles, then Prince William, then Prince George, then Princess Charlotte. And then if it's a boy or a girl, it will take its place behind Princess Charlotte. Hugo Vickers says Prince Harry will then become sixth in line, 
something he may be quite happy about. Which, of course, means that there's even less chance of him becoming king, which possibly makes it a little easier for him to marry whomsoever he wishes. Last week, thousands gathered outside Kensington Palace to mark the 20th anniversary of Princess Diana's death. This time, they had something to celebrate. I love William and Harry, and uh, this morning, my husband writes, have you heard the good news from William and Kate, the third child? Yes, we were very happy. I love it, yes, I meant to look forward to it. I loved it, yeah. I was excited when Diana was having her babies. Couldn't wait to hear what she was having, and now Kate and William, fantastic, lovely. <laughs> The Queen made no official mention of the news during her public appearance today, but her smile left little doubt. According to the palace, she's delighted. Uh, coming up after six, Stephen Joyce responds to The Economist. We've spoken to none of whom can find an $11.7 billion hole. Lots of feedback. This from Lisa. Jonathan Coleman's increase in elective surgery works out at 2.5% per year, given our population increased by 2.1% last year, and National is showing no inclination to reduce immigration. That works out at an increase of 0.4% per year if you factor in the ageing population. It amounts to three-fifths of sweet FA. We've had lots of feedback along those lines tonight, and also lots of feedback about how distressing people are finding it for elderly relatives who are waiting for elective surgery. After the news, economists go looking for an $11.7 billion hole and Stephen Joyce responds to the fact they couldn't find it. RNZ News at 6. Maloe Lalei, good afternoon. Call Katrina Bat in Aho. A number of economists have come to Labor's defence after National alleged there were major errors in its fiscal plan. National's campaign manager Stephen Joyce said Labor had an $11.7 billion hole in its alternative budget. But several economists have said that Labor's numbers add up. ANZ's chief economist Cameron Bagri says there isn't a hole, but he says it will be a challenge for Labor to govern within its budget. They just haven't left themselves any money in the kitty for the 2019 and the 2020 budget. There is some leeway. Now, they've factored in quite a big uplift in health and education spending, but if you look beyond that, law and order, call out government services, you know, those sort of areas, you know, the sort of working assumption is that they're not going to get anything. Cameron Bagri says it's good Labor has been transparent and provided a very detailed set of proposals. Some of the smaller parties are dismissing child poverty reduction targets set by National and Labour as a cheap political stunt. Both major parties have committed to lifting 100,000 children out of poverty by 2020. The Greens say both have been too late to the party and they've had that target since the last election. New Zealand First says it's a blatant political bribe that doesn't address the root cause of poverty, lack of housing. The Māori Party says neither large party can be trusted to make progress on its own and it would introduce a universal living wage to lift all people out of poverty. Mumps continues to spread throughout the Auckland region with 300 confirmed cases since January, more than the total number of mumps cases over the past 16 years. Health authorities say those most at risk are aged 10 to 29. They're part of a so-called lost generation who missed out on the MMR vaccine during a now discredited controversy over it in 1989. A change in the timing of the second dose of the vaccine in 2001 also confused many, lessening overall immunity. A medical officer of health, Josephine Herman, says it's a huge problem. We shouldn't be seeing um, measles, rubella and mumps in this day and age with the technology that we have and the advances we've made um, in health services delivery and we know that vaccination works. Dr Herman says 60% of all cases so far this year concern young Pacific adolescents. The Nelson woman who fought to change the rules around the use of, med of medicinal cannabis since the death of her son Alex in 2015 has confirmed she wiped rat poison on Nelson MPs on Nelson's MP on Saturday. Rose Renton says she did it to send a message about the lack of respect for democracy. Dr Smith has complained to the police over the incident in which he says threats were made against his family during his regular public meetings next to the Nelson market. Ms Renton says she acted with her husband and that there was no threat to anyone's safety. It was a message. I spent two years in the political arena being shoved aside. I've got to the point I no longer care about the political view because we are ignored as people. 
Rose Renton says she has so far not been approached by the police. Principals strongly disagree with National Party claims that nearly 4,000 prefabricated rooms are state-of-the-art classrooms. In last night's leaders' debate, the National Party leader, Bill English, said 3,700 prefab classrooms are modern learning environments, a new style of open-plan classroom. Our education correspondent John Gerritsen reports. Mr English told the debate the government has spent $5 billion bringing schools up to scratch and the 3,700 prefabs in schools are modern learning environments. Principals say that assertion provoked tweets and Facebook posts by outraged teachers. The Principals Federation and the Secondary Principals Association say most prefabricated buildings in schools are old. The National Party has clarified its leader's statement by saying many of the classrooms have been modified to include features of modern learning environments. This is John Gerritsen. Hurricane Irma, which is barreling towards the Caribbean, has been upgraded to a powerful Category 4. Hurricane advisories have been issued for territories that dot the West Indies, including parts of the British and US Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. A BBC forecaster Matt Taylor says the storm continues to intensify and could pummel the area with life-threatening wind, storm surges and torrential rain. This is actually probably a bigger storm overall than Harvey, bigger spatially and also wind strength. It's already a Category 4 status. Uh, we've got winds gusting well over 220 kilometres an hour and it could strengthen a little bit further as it heads into the Caribbean during the next 24 to 36 hours. Irma at the moment is out in the mid-Atlantic, she's strengthening and pushing into the Lesser Antilles. It's going to be a major storm, a devastating storm, destructive storm across these areas. Forecaster Matt Taylor. It's five past six. To sport, the All Whites have qualified for football's World Cup intercontinental playoff after eking out a two-all draw with the Solomon Islands in Honiara. New Zealand won the home and away tie 8-3 on aggregate after winning the first tie of the first leg of the tie 6-1, and will now play the fifth-placed South American team for a place at the World Cup in Russia next year. Coach Anthony Hudson was relieved to have come away with a draw in the heat and humidity of Honiara. They gave us a real test today. We had a few players out of position. I was sort of questioning how that would happen in the game, and, and I, but I think it was it was a tough game. But in the end, I was pleased just to get you know get a point on the road and, and get through to the final. Anthony Hudson. Roger Federer and Rafa Nadal remain on course for a semi-final showdown at the US Tennis Open. Federer is through to the quarterfinals after a straight sets win over Philippe Kohlschreiber. He'll play Argentine Ma uh, Juan Martin Del Potro, who beat Federer in the 2009 US Open final after Del Potro overcame illness to beat six seed Dominic Thiem in a five-setter lasting over three and a half hours. Meanwhile, New Zealand's French Open doubles champion Michael Venus remains on course for a second Grand Slam tennis title this year. Venus and Taipei's Hao Ching Chan are through to the semi-finals of the mixed doubles in New York. Any time you're in a Grand Slam to be in the second week, it's, it's exciting. Bopana and Dabrowski, who we played today, they won the French Open mixed and um, they played quite a few slams together and that, so they, they know each other well and, and that, so yeah, it was, a, it was a good win to get over there. Michael Venus. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, we have a window on the world of Abdi, a young Somalian refugee who wins the lottery, the green card lottery. His prize, an official United States permanent resident card. A year on, is he still winning? There's an election debate focusing on issues from north of the Bombay Hills, and this week's pundit, the left-leaning Brian Roper, laments cuts in university arts funding. On Nights, oh, the humanities or lack of them, after the news at 7 on RNZ National. Now, normally, every night, we would have the weather. Are we doing the weather or we're dropping the weather? We're dropping the weather. Um, we'll have weather at 7. Yeah, we've got weather at 7. It's not bad, ladies and gentlemen. But we want to scramble Stephen Joyce into the programme because he's about to board a plane and he's bent over backwards to be with us tonight. Uh, Mr Joyce, thank you so much for joining us. Are you there? I can... I can give you an update, John. It's foggy in Nelson. Right. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, why, that's, that's, why, you that's why you're land. right. That's why you couldn't land. land. Okay. It, it wasn't. Yeah. It, well, it, now we're in Blenheim and it's raining. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, Katrina's going to have the weather at length at seven o'clock if anyone is worried about it. And we were going to run before you, 
a piece from Zach Fleming in which he speaks to Tim Hazeldean, Professor of Economics at Auckland University, Sam Warburton, Research Fellow at the New Zealand Initiative, Burles Executive Director Ganesh Nana, Economics Columnist Brian Fellow and ANZ Chief Econ Economist Cameron Bagri, who all say there isn't mm. an $11.7 billion hole. Now I'm sorry you can't hear them before you respond to them, but they're saying there's no hole. Uh, well, actually, well, I'm not sure that everybody's agreed on that. Um, I've heard uh, Cameron Bagri's comments, and he's made the point that actually it doesn't look viable what they're proposing. Now they've said that, uh, no, these are our allowances um, and this is all we're going to um, have, then actually there's some really big questions to be asked about uh, how sustainable uh, their numbers are over the next few years. Why didn't you government. ask those questions? Why didn't you talk about sustainability? And Cameron Bagri is saying, actually, it's going to be tight, and I'm not sure they can Very deliver tight. on it. But he's not saying, and no one is saying, including Cameron Bagri, who is the chief economist with New Zealand's largest trading bank, there is an $11.7 billion hole. The only person well, saying, saying it is you. Yep, and I'm saying it because actually I know the numbers. Um, I've just grappled with uh, the uh, New Zealand budget in the last round. I've been working on the budget for uh, nine years now, eight as associate and one as minister. And I can tell you, you have to have money set aside or signed from education and health for every single budget. And what Labor are saying is they're saying to me, no, you're wrong, your theory about allowances. Instead, we will have outside education and health, zero budgets. That's what they're saying for two years, which is just completely untenable. Yeah, this is and, a reinvention. Uh, this, and, is, and, this is a reinvention, isn't no, it? No. I mean, you are the boy who no, cried not, wolf not and are now telling no. us actually it was a no, thoroughly sorry, unpleasant no, dog. No, that, no, 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 no hold sorry, on a sec, hold on a sec. No, I've been in... No, you hold on a sec. Well, no, no, but wait a sec. I've been, in, I've been in this business a long time and I have so never I. seen such a weight of economists stacked up against a national cabinet minister. It is unprecedented. I've just listed the ones that are in Zach's story, but there's a whole lot of other ones. Eric Crampton, Michael Reddle, who was the former head of finance, financial markets for the Do Reserve Bank. you have Bank. a question, John? The question is, are they all wrong? Uh, in terms of the budget allowances, if they are saying that Labor can deliver these budget allowances, then I'm sorry they are. And the reason is because you can't have zero budgets two years in a row with all the spending promises that Labor has outside of education and health. And I can tell you, because just go and look at the numbers, our budget, last, this last one that we've done, the non-education and health spend was a billion dollars a year, just under, in fact, and that is $4 billion over four years. That's new money that has to be applied in budget 2017. The year before, which was budget 2016, it was the same, just under $4 billion over four years. Labor are saying they won't do that, so there's $8 billion right there. And we're ta not talking about just trivial things. We're talking about things like police wage increases. We're talking about things like anybody else's wage increases. We're talking about, say, science investment, anything incremental, the justice sector, the defence sector. They've all said those will be zero budgets. So the other, but the this, other but this doesn't. This. But this isn't an eleven point seven billion dollar hole. And let's yes, look at I've Eric Crampton. You. No, it's I not. I told you two, two well, years. Well, hold, two years hold, of that hold on, hold on a second. So if Tim no, Hazeldean says it's not, if Sam Wardworthen says it's not, if Garnish Nana says it's not, if Brian Fellow says it's not, if Cameron Bagri says it's not, if Sharma Bill Jacob says it's not, well, if I'm Keith Ings says it's not, if Vernon Small says it's not, if Bernard Hickey says it's not, and if Eric Crampton says it's not. Why are you able to come on the radio and claim it is? Shouldn't you have made a more subtle and nuanced argument about the pressure no. on spending in the years to come rather than claiming an $11.7 billion hole? Because, that's the, because that is the sum of money which would be required to, for them to be able to meet their commitments. Now, you can uh, throw me names uh, all around. I've, I would say I've heard from some of those people and some of them are not saying what they claim to be saying. Others will always say that. Tim Hazeldean is never going to agree with me, never has, never will. And there'll be others in that category as well. But the point is this. Forget who's saying what. It's not a, it's not a vote as to whether these numbers are here. They're either accurate or they're not. And all I can say to you is if you go and have a look at the numbers. In fact, why, not, why have me on? Why not have Grant Robertson on and ask him where is his money for things like defence, the justice sector, 
conservation. Where is all that in his proposed budgets for 2018-2019? Because Get him to because, show you the lines. Because, Mr. He, Mr. because he hasn't. Mr. Joyce, that's no, he, respond, no he, responded at, he responded at length yesterday and we ran it on checkpoint. You were the yeah, person... Yeah, he responded at length, but he didn't actually answer any of the questions. You, you, you were the person who came out... You were the person who came out with the media statement yep. yesterday morning, $11.7 billion hole. Now, that's right. the thing to do in these circumstances, and it's a very difficult situation to cover for journalists because you were saying black and Labour are saying white and you were saying whole and they're saying no. So what people do is they go off and seek independent analysis and overview from people who are really good and dispassionate and don't come like Cameron Bagri from a position I suspect of it being a card carrying well, Labour Party well, I member. think you should no no and, but and, you, and should what listen, you should listen to him on the subject but he's he's, saying, he's, actually, he's, saying he's saying there's no hole the money there. there's no hole no, he's, he's not, saying he's it will be tight been. and you should have said it will be tight we wouldn't be having no, this discussion if you time. hadn't come out and said 11.7 billion dollar hole if you had been more measured and said, actually, let's look ahead, can Labor afford to do anything? Is this anything? a lecture or a question? Uh, well, it's a response, well, I guess. Come on, then, because actually, no, fair enough. It's but a response to what you, you said, you, said you yesterday. No, well, do you want to elucidate anything from me, or do you just want to give me a lecture? Well, well, well I guess I'd like to elucidate something more than you would well, be sticking good. to a position. Well, I'm trying to tell you why it doesn't work, John. And the reason it doesn't work is because... It either has absolutely, uh, the, as I say, the way I said yesterday, which is the operating allowances are not uh, uh, are not organised correctly, are literally wrong, or the alternative, which Labor is saying, which is actually no, and we'll have zero budgets outside of education and health for two years. And actually, neither of those are tenable. And instead of sort of, you know, running a popularity contest amongst people, I think it's important that we actually ask these questions because... It is possible that they be elected in September 24th. That's what this election is all about. And I certainly don't want people to turn around afterwards if that happened and say, gosh, we didn't know it was going to be so expensive. So when, you, say, when you said yesterday these are significant areas that raise questions about That's Labor's right. whole spending approach and their fiscal competence... Yep. You're not resiling from that, that, and in the face of the analysis from these economists, you are sticking entirely to the $11.7 billion hole. You don't want to resolve from that figure, do you? No, I don't want to resolve so, from that so, so and, you're, and actually, I'm happy to talk about it with any of them. In fact, I've talked about it with a couple of them today. And as I've sort of got into it, it's, look, it's face value, it's not an easy... Uh, it's, it's not the first thing that, that people think of, because people do get, in terms of... Um, and, and I would also stress that this is actually about accountancy, not actually economics in the sense of you know the the economic profession. But nevertheless, the 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 numbers first blush, uh, you know, take a little bit of working your way through. But once you get through them and you have a look at them, and as I say, I've been working with these allowances and how they work for nine years. I do know how they work. I'm certainly not going to risk my reputation on something which is incorrect. No, and you... And, and the and, fact and, of the matter is, these numbers don't work. Right. Now, the numbers at first blush take a bit of getting through if you don't do numbers for a living. But Cameron Bagri mm. does. Shamabil Yakob does. Brian Fallow yes. does. Sam Warburton and does. Him, Tim I Hazeldean repeat, does. Heard, hang, on, hang on a second. If you heard uh, Cameron Bagri on a, on, a, on a competing radio station this afternoon... He was pointing out that it was highly unlikely that these numbers could be achieved because of the reasons that I'm pointing out. The reasons that I'm pointing out is you'd have to believe that the Labor Party would run outside of education and health zero budgets twice, or they're going to run something which is more reasonable, which is about a uh, billion dollars a year over four years, which come, adds to eight billion dollars across two budgets. Okay. You mean, um, and that's and that's my belief. My okay. belief is that they have to do that because I, you know, I know the numbers and I know what's required. I know the sort of things that you have to put money aside for in defence and police every couple of years for their wage increases, for things like additional investment in social development and so on. I'm not talking about benefits. I'm talking about the things that you have to do to get people into work. All of those things. And that's across every single portfolio aside from education and health. And generally, 
the government adds new spending each year. Okay. And that new spending is roughly 50% education and health and 50% everything else. And okay. what Labor are saying is the only way we can make this set up is if that everything else is nothing. Okay. And I just don't buy that. I'm sorry. Mr Joyce, who is not resiling one bit from his statement uh, about $11.7 billion and the hole in Labor's fiscal numbers, thank you for joining us because you've made a real effort and you have to board a plane. Now, what we were going to do and what we would have done in the normal course of events is play the economist to Mr Joyce and then get him to respond to them. But because he had to go, we can't do that. But in fact, we have Cameron Bagri amongst The Economist Zach Fleming has spoken to, so let's listen to them. It started yesterday on Checkpoint with economics columnist Brian Fallow. In terms of the argument, I think uh, Robertson's right and Joyce is wrong. It, it's not really that complicated. So the, the money isn't missing. It's, it's just been reallocated. After hours of journalists and economists stopping short of saying who was right and who was wrong, Mr Fallow did. Then opinion pieces started appearing elsewhere. Experts writing for the spin-off and the newsroom both said there was no hole. But seemingly unfazed, National Party leader Bill English doubled down, telling the country in last night's leaders' debate that Labour does have a nearly $12 billion hole in its fiscal policy. Look, the numbers don't add up. And this is why, when, the, when you look at how they've calculated things, what they've done is this. They've said, let's say the police get a pay increase. They've done, they've, what they've said is, we've got enough money to pay it for one year, but not for the years after. So they just haven't true. rolled it out. Burl, an independent company Labour employed to check its books, stands by its work. Chief Executive Ganesh Nana says Mr Joyce is categorically wrong. It's just pure fiction based on uh, disagreement over definitions. And nerds like me love it, but I don't <laughs> really see how it's... And, and I wouldn't expect voters to be at all interested in what an operating allowance is. I would expect voters to be more interested in where is the spending happening and is that spending actually worthwhile. Sam Warburton, a research fellow at the New Zealand Initiative, says National has made a basic accounting error. Stephen Joyce is wrong and Grant Robertson's right. There is no... $12 billion hole. There might be plus, plus or minus some things on the margin, but no hole. So what mistake has National made here? Uh, Labor, Labor put out a budget which had about uh, 17, 18 lines in it. Um, they looked at one line and saw that that line was uh, lower than both National's line in their pre -through and then looked at Labor's spending promises and saw there wasn't enough. But what they didn't look at was all the 15 or 16 lines above that one line. They didn't look at the budget in its entirety. And so if they had done that, they would have seen that money had been allocated to the other lines. And those other lines are health and education and social welfare and housing and one or two others. Tim Hazeldean, a professor of economics at Auckland University, says, you guessed it, no hole. I don't think the word whole is justified at all. Whole implies like something that's lost or unknown or forgotten or whatever. It seems pretty clear that it's just a different way of, of counting things up. Using the word whole is a bit of... Um, it's, it's easy, actually. I don't think that's reasonable to do, no. And finally, here's the chief economist at ANZ, New Zealand's biggest bank, Cameron Bagri. The Labor Party has provided quite a detailed spending program over the coming four years. Uh, and that provides uh, some clarity over where spending plans are going to be and what the fiscal numbers could look like. And I think the real issue here is that it'll be a huge challenge to hit the numbers. The term hold is, I think, too strong. The term hole, I think, is too strong. Cameron Bagri. Now, we would have had Stephen Joyce responding to that and it would have been nice for him to hear Cameron Bagri, but unfortunately he called us at about five past six because he had to get on a flight. So, the other way around. But you heard Stephen Joyce and you heard The Economist's 21 past six, your checkpoint on RNZ. National has done an about-face on setting a child poverty reduction target. During last night's leaders' debate, Bill English said he would set a target of lifting 100,000 children out of poverty in the next term of a national government. His predecessor, John Key, had long refused to set a target, saying child poverty was too hard to measure, although argue, others argue that it was simply because the government lacked the will to do so. Shortly, we'll bring you political reaction on that, but first, here's one 38-year-old mother who's trying to raise her 11-year-old daughter on a benefit. The woman who's asked to be identified just as Rebecca gets $420 a week, but her share of the rent in West Auckland is $330 a week. That's left Rebecca turning to charitable groups for help with furniture and clothes for her daughter.
I think we all want what's best for our children at the end of the day and um, it, it is a bit of a struggle trying to get everything for her. I've had to rely on um, the Salvation Army in regards to food um, and furniture wise because I've all but probably been in my apartment for just over three weeks now so that's been really hard. I have to make use of of what agencies are out there in order to support, to, well, to actually get to where I want to be. That's, that's a hard thing to do. So, back in the political fray, what do the parties have to say about National's new child poverty target? Our political editor, Jane Patterson, filed this report. Here's a start, Paddy. On the 1st of April next year, because of the package we put in place in the budget, child poverty in New Zealand, according to the standard international measure, will drop by 30%, 50,000 fewer kids in poverty. I'm proud of that. We can do that in New Zealand now. Bill English went on to say a re-elected national government would also commit to lifting a further 50,000 children out of poverty with further initiatives over the next couple of years. The national leader says the government would measure success by the level of people's incomes. Speaking in Wellington this morning, Mr English explained why he chose to come out with a target now, just two and a half weeks before the election. We've never said you can't measure it. What we've said is there's a whole lot of measures. Uh, so it, it, just take for instance, just take um, the family incomes package. So we can raise the incomes of those with the lowest incomes and the highest house prices. They're the one, highest house housing costs. They're the ones who are really under pressure. Now alongside that we've got, so that raises their income, we've actually got free GP visits for under 13s. Now that doesn't uh, increase their income according to that measure, but it will reduce material hardship. The Labour leader Jacinda Ardern, a long-time children's advocate, applauds the target and has committed to doing the same. But she wants more details about how National would assess if it was meeting the target. We agree there is no one measure. In fact, there are five um, that are internationally used. Our proposal has been to put those into law and then to have targets against each of them. Uh, I did seek clarification from Bill English last night about which baseline he was using. Um, uh, you know, I, look, I know that that seems like a complicated thing to be asking in a debate, but just a little bit of clarity around that would have certainly have helped the argument. The fact that we're still having this discussion about the numbers proves why it's important to be transparent. There are at least five different ways to measure child poverty, including families' incomes before or after housing costs and whether they earn less than 50 or 60 per cent of the median income. Other measurements include material deprivation, which look at how many essential items children who live in poor households go without, such as a raincoat and shoes. Regardless of how it's measured, James Shaw says the two major parties are finally catching up with the Greens on tackling child poverty. The Green Party went into the 2014 general election with exactly this target to lift 100,000 kids out of poverty. Um, we're actually going into this election saying, actually, we know what it takes to lift the 212,000 children who are below the government's poverty line up above that. The Māori Party co-leader Marama Fox says National and Labour are coming up with targets on the hoof to attract voters. She says it's largely the support partners who will decide the fate of child poverty targets. It doesn't matter whether it's red or blue, it's who their support partners are going to be coming into this election. And if we have a right wing mixed with Winston, then that is no hope for any of us. And if we have a left wing side mixed with Winston, that again is no hope for any of us. The New Zealand First leader Winston Peters says the Promises from Labour and National are just desperate bids to gain political power. He says neither is addressing the root cause of poverty, a lack of housing. This is preposterous because if you don't house people, then how can you begin to deal with poverty? And here's the real point. They're not even building enough houses for those that get off at the airport. Even if you cut it to 50,000, they still are not building enough houses for those. So whatever the housing crisis is here, it'll stay here. Meanwhile, the campaign promises continue to roll out. Nationals promising a funding boost for elective surgery with the aim of increasing the number of operations to 200,000 a year by 2022 at a cost of $120 million a year. Labor's focusing on trades training with a new Prime Minister's award giving top students in public high schools taking vocational courses $2,000 each. For Checkpoint, Jane Patterson. 
Aid officials say refugee camps in Bangladesh are facing tremendous strain as thousands of Muslim Rohingya pour into Bangladesh every day. The UN Refugee Agency says 73,000 Rohingya Muslims have now fled to Bangladesh from Myanmar since the army there began a campaign against militants less than two weeks ago. UN aid workers in Bangladesh say hundreds more are arriving every hour. The BBC's Sanjoy Majumda is on the Bangladesh side of the Myanmar border. She is just two days old and completely oblivious to the mayhem outside. Her parents are Rohingyas, forced out of their homes in Myanmar when their village was attacked, allegedly by the army. The baby's mother, Hasina, was in her final stages of pregnancy when they made the strenuous journey across the border to Bangladesh. We fled and crossed the river by boat and then came here. We were very scared about what the military would do to us. After coming here, we heard that our house has been burnt down. Do you think you'll ever be able to take your baby back home, back to Myanmar? Everyone has left. There's no one there. We cannot go back. Home is now this vast refugee camp where they live cheek by jowl with thousands of Rohingyas. Many of them are eating their first proper meal in days. Just four days ago, there was nothing here. It was just the side of a hill with a clump of trees on it. But now look at it. It's a vast settlement, a temporary home for all the Rohingya refugees who've come over from Myanmar and have nowhere to go. And even this place is going to reach its limit in a few days. Bangladesh is now struggling to cope with the growing influx of Rohingyas, hundreds streaming in by the hour and more waiting to follow. Satellite images obtained by Human Rights Watch show entire villages burned down inside Myanmar. Fresh smoke could be seen again today, billowing into the sky, apparently from houses that were torched. More than 400 Rohingyas have been killed in 10 days, the worst violence in a generation. The houses are burned and fired, and uh, at the same time there are uh, atrocities and intimidations in different forms. As it is occurring in Myanmar land, so we can presume that who is doing this. It is hard to independently verify the situation. Access is severely restricted. But in the refugee camps, it is apparent that the Rohingyas are here to stay. And the next generation may never get to know their homeland. The BBC Sanjoy Majumdar ending checkpoint for tonight. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back tomorrow at 5. RNZ news headlines at 6.30. Several economists have come to Labour's defence after National said there were major errors in its fiscal plan. Health authorities say there's no sign of the mumps outbreak in Auckland debating with the surge in cases worrying them. And the Nelson woman who fought for changes to rules around the use of medicinal cannabis since the death of her son has confirmed she wiped rat poison on MP Nick Smith. Our next news and weather is at 7. This is Trending Now, our feature highlighting the stories you've been sharing via digital and social media. Here's Catherine Ryan from 9 to noon. Our next guest is the wildlife writer for the Smithsonian Magazine where she's covered everything from vampire anthropology to bioluminescent marine life. Abigail Tucker's work